This episode of the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Forte. You're listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. Tune in weekly as we interview music teachers and experts from around the world to explore creative activities and ideas that build learning connections in students. Our integrated music teaching approach will deepen your students' understanding of musical concepts, engage them in critical thinking, improve their reading and performance, foster their curiosity, and prepare them for a lifetime of music making. Hi there, teachers. It's Tim Topham here, and welcome back to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. Great to be spending some more time with you this week. Hope you've had a great week. And looking forward to hanging out and spending some time with my guest and I all talking about playing by ear. Uh, Now, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder as well. We've got our special event coming up. It's our one day laying by ear challenge. It's coming up. It's totally free and it's happening on Monday, the 22nd of May at 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is 8 a.m. Melbourne on Tuesday, the 23rd of May. And in it, we're going to be unpacking a pop song by ear live. And I'm going to be getting your help, whoever's there on the call who wants to join in, answer questions, ask questions, and then I'm going to be sending you a challenge to do the same thing yourself and then share the results with us. It's going to be super fun. It's going to be held over in one of our Facebook groups. But to get all the information you need, just head to topmusic.co slash challenge and you'll be able to find out about how to sign up. It's, as I say, all free and there'll be replays if you can't make it live. And I look forward to hanging out with lots of you then. Our podcast review comes from Dewey Land from the USA, and it's all about the episode that I shared a few years ago with Susan DeWedger, uh, now Susan Eldridge, about preparing students for their future. And uh, Dewey Land says, great podcast to reflect on how I can teach my students in their best interest, not simply to teach the way I was taught. Wonderful ideas on how to motivate students to want to keep playing. And I love the ideas on how to help parents form a good practice routine for their children. It's always good to hear on podcasts what has worked well and not so well for the people presenting. I learned so much from hearing your stories. Thank you very much, Dewey Land. If you're listening to this, then shoot us an email, support at topmusic.co, so that we can send you a thank you gift for taking the time to review the podcast. And if you'd like to do the same thing and be the chance to win a gift as well, we would be delighted if you could spend a couple of minutes to leave us a review. You can do it through whatever podcast app you're listening to, or if you're not too sure how to do it, you can head over to topmusic.co slash iTunes, where we give you all the instructions. My guest today, Joseph Hoffman, is a pianist and conductor and began playing piano at age six. While continuing his musical studies in piano and conducting at Brigham Young University, Mr. Hoffman was appointed chorus master and conductor for numerous BYU opera productions, including Carmen and Pirates of Penzance. He conducted the 300 Voice University Chorale and taught courses for music majors in music theory, conducting and sight singing. After graduating with a Master's of Music in 2005, he started the Hoffman Academy of Music in Portland, Oregon, which now serves over 300 students with a faculty of 14 teachers. Hoffman also serves as an adjudicator of piano festivals, provides training to piano teachers, and created a series of free video piano lessons on his website over at hoffmanacademy.com. Welcome to the show, Joseph, or should I call you Mr. Hoffman? Joseph is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, wonderful to finally meet you. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been following each other for some some time. And you've just reminded me before we hit record that we actually met at MTNA in Florida, uh, although right. very briefly. So it's going to be great to dive in a little bit more to your story today. And you've made you've made quite a name for yourself as an amazing teacher of students, both online and uh, in person through the Hoffman Academy and your Hoffman Method. Um, and so in a minute, yeah, I'd love to unpack more about how you got there. But first, um, I watched one of your videos on your website where you mentioned that one of the reasons you got into teaching in the first place was that you found that kids love music. I think this is the quote, kids love music, but hate piano lessons. Uh, and you said that really the reason was that you know, music is, is great fun, but the teaching methods for so many students was, were just really outdated. And then... The more I dug in, the more I realized just how aligned our missions are. Um, while I've focused on changing approaches in pedagogy by working with teachers, um, you've created this incredible method and online learning platform uh, all geared at students. Um, but I think we're two sides of the same coin in some ways. What do you feel makes your approach different to the other ones that are out there? I think if I had to pick one thing, I 
really believe in the principle of sound before symbol. And watching some of your videos, I, I see that you have this same belief that kids are at their core very natural imitators. And if you want to get a kid started, you don't want to put a bunch of symbols in front of them because now their brain is overloaded and they can't really make music while they're also trying to decode all these unfamiliar symbols. So instead of putting a book in front of them, we get them making music through imitation, singing, chanting, demonstration. Kids imitate, you get them making music, and then you can show them the symbols later. I believe in teaching kids to sight read. I think that's a very critical skill, but it's not the first thing that we should be starting with. And do you, do you relate this to the language learning model? Because uh, I know there's the more research I do about it, there is some arguments both for and against is music a language that we learn in the same way as language or are we just kind of saying that because of what you've said that engagement in music before actually reading it's the better way to go i think there are many parallels to language learning and i do follow closely what research is being done in say language acquisition as well as reading like how kids learn to read their native language. I think there are many parallels. U music is unique in some elements. There's an element of timing that spoken language doesn't have. There's an element of pitch, obviously. But I think there are so many parallels that as music educators, I I've learned so much. And when I try to apply the science of learning reading, and obviously there's so much more money that gets spent on researching reading English, you know, and so music education, I think if we can piggyback on all of that research, I've seen nothing but positive by treating music like a language. Yes, it's unique. And yes, it requires some unique approaches specified specific to music. But overall, I, I see a lot of great parallels. I loved another quote um, in a video that I saw where, where you said kids were having so much fun with the Hoffman method that parents were making practice a reward for finishing their chores. Now, this could, of course, be just great marketing, but uh, I actually believe this <laughs> it, it could be true. True story. <laughs> <laughs> true story. So, why are your kids so excited to play that uh, parents having to stop them playing until they've done their chores? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is a true story. I have to say, not all of our parents say that, obviously, <laughs> you know, or we'd be, you know, world famous, but. It really did delight me to hear that anecdote from one of our families. And in general, I hear really positive things. When parents come back after a first lesson for maybe their second lesson, almost invariably, they say the minute the kid got home, they ran to the piano and couldn't wait to play the first song that they had just. And that that warms my heart. And that tells me we're doing something right. When kids get home, they see a piano or parents will also tell me, their kids are on vacation, they're at a hotel, they see a piano in the lobby and they run over and they want to play something. And I didn't used to hear that from my parents when I first started teaching. And sometimes I wish 20 years ago when I didn't know what I was doing as a teacher, I wish I could go back and give a refund to all those students sometimes because I, I have learned so much. And one thing that I learned from my Kodai training is that it's important to get kids playing high quality music from the very start. Most method books, it's about 90%, I would say educational content where it was composed for the purpose of teaching like where is middle C and we're gonna focus on C and D and it's a song all in quarter notes and half notes just to teach C and D. Well, I, I guarantee you in 50 years, no one is going to remember some little song of C and D or, you know, in a hundred years, are we going to be humming any of the tunes from the primer level one of this method or that <laughs> method? No, it's not enduring great music. But what Kodai really believed, the Hungarian educator, uh, was that kids, if you teach them real folk music from the start, folk music is great educational material because the patterns are simple. They're very tuneful. They're very memorable. And so in my method, what I've done is I would say that ratio of 90% educational, 10% like real classic or folk, 
I flipped that where it's 90 percent real folk, real classical uh, music that has already been filtered through the test of time. We know it's quality. We know it's tuneful. It's singable. It's memorable. Kids enjoy playing real quality music. And then 10 percent, maybe things I've composed just to help teach a very specific content. But if you give kids high quality music, they love playing it. Some teachers would say, though, that that music is too hard if they're just if you're just trying to learn C and D or quarter notes uh, and the folk tunes got dotted rhythms and things like that in it, wouldn't that be too hard to play? Isn't that the reason why it's kind of dumbed down? You know, this is a, a funny thing. It depends on how you teach it. Like I, I've seen method books with like a popular series or whatever, and they're playing, let's say, Hedwig's theme or something, and they've dumbed it down to all quarter notes. And the kids will put in the complicated rhythms because they know what it's supposed That's what to it sound sounds like. like. And yeah. you can't make them play it like the simplified way because it's in their ear. So if you use an ear approach, th that's another thing. Like what great melody do you know that's all quarter notes, half notes and whole notes? It's just too boring, right? It doesn't exist. And so we teach kids melodies with eighth notes from the start because that's the fun stuff. Like kids can handle eighth notes if they're taught by ear, use the Kodai, T, T, and Ta, or there's a hundred different ways to count rhythms. But if you're trying to teach them one and two and, that's where it breaks down and you're making it too mathematical. Just teach it as a chant or as a sound, let them imitate it. You can show them the symbols later and that's how you make it fun. And it, it, they, they can handle complexity. I mean, we have kids who are five, six years old playing 16th notes. You're not counting one ianda, two ianda. You're just saying ticky, 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 ticky. And a preschooler can say ticky, ticky. And, and they love it. It's fun. When I was interested to uh, in, in, introduce, I should say, to Kadai over here maybe 10 years ago, and I should say for those listening, if you're not familiar with Kadai, it's spelled K-O-D-A-L-Y, Kadai, that's the guy's name. The we use ticker ticker actually for 16th notes over here, uh, but it really made a lot of sense to me, and I've always incorporated that into my teaching rather than one eander and one and two and. Um, although I think there's 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 arguments that both can be valuable at different times. I think so. It's it's great to hear that that's been part of your uh, your method and approach. I want to get back to teaching, um, talking more a little about playing by ear in a moment. But um, before then, I'd love to just hear the story, if uh, if we could, about how you move from being a single teacher with one student to uh, someone with 200,000 YouTube subscribers and a sizable team and your online platform and all that kind of stuff. Can you give us the, the, uh, the background? For sure. So I started teaching piano during grad school. And I was actually studying to be a conductor, wanted to get a DMA and teach university. To help pay my way, I started teaching kids in the neighborhood piano lessons. And again, didn't have any idea what I was doing. I just went to the music store, asked, what's the most common method these days? I'd grown up with John Thompson uh, at the store. They said, oh, lots of people like the Faber method. So I tried Faber. It, when I went through music school, at the university level, I realized there were a lot of holes in my learning. I, I thought I was a pretty accomplished pianist and had a great music background. Um, I'd done AP music theory and it, like I struggled with ear oral dictation classes and realized that with the sight reading approach I had been taught by, my ear felt really underdeveloped. And then in music history classes, learning that all these past great composers were proficient improvisers. And I was like, why did no one ever bother to teach me improvisation? And I just started, it started to really bother me that when I was teaching kids piano, I felt like I wasn't giving them a very well-rounded education that was going to prepare them to be the best musician they could be. Not that I expected them to go on necessarily to become professional musicians, but I wanted to teach in a way that if they did want to go on, I had prepared them to the very best of my ability, but I couldn't find a method that actually included all the things that I thought were important from ear training to composing 
to improvising, to transposing. I played for voice lessons sometimes, and a teacher asked me, oh, could you transpose this? And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, no, I can't transpose. Where's the button uh, on the keyboard to transpose it? <laughs> exactly, right, right. <laughs> so I, I wanted to give my students more than I could find. So I started researching other methods. I studied the Suzuki method, and I took some coursework on that, read some books, tried the Suzuki method for a while, but found like it didn't quite seem right for me and uh, didn't really have a strong sight reading component, which I thought was so important. Even though by then I was really believing the, a lot of the ear first philosophies I was learning about, but then studied Kodai and that filled in a lot of the, how do you teach sight reading? And it's by, you do a lot of dictations early on. So you take a, fa a familiar melody and you dictate that. And you can take a simple melody like hot cross buns. You can dictate the rhythm. And that's how you introduce quarter notes and eighth notes and quarter rests. It's using a familiar song to teach them unfamiliar symbols rather than the other way around. A lot of method books, they're giving them an unfamiliar symbol. And now they have to use these unfamiliar symbols to play unfamiliar songs. And the kids, it's just too much cognitive load for them yeah. to handle and have fun at the same time. So I, I started working on building my own method when I realized I couldn't find one. And quickly, I also was teaching some, as a grad student, I was teaching some undergrad music classes and realized I love working with adults as well as kids. So the concept for a music academy kind of married both of my loves. I love working with adults, training teachers, working with musicians, and I love working with kids. So I had this vision for building a music school, training teachers in this new piano method that I was working on. And uh, once I got that going and had hired a few teachers and started realizing that a lot of families in our area, they would sign up one of their kids, but they I knew they had you know two other kids at home. And when I would ask, they're like, oh, this is just too expensive to have all of our kids in music. And that really made me sad. I was like, ah, you know, these kids could be getting such a great experience. And that's when I started tinkering with putting my lessons on YouTube. And they started getting views. And that one thing led to another. And I slowly have been working on building an online program. So the method where whatever it i think it works great in conjunction with live teaching we have our own studio here in portland oregon with about 200 students who come weekly for a live lesson but then at home they can keep the lessons or keep the learning going with the online lessons and then families who say can't afford private instruction all those videos are there for them as well Amazing. And and I think a lot of that content you provide for free. Is that right? The video content early on, I decided I wanted to make free. Yes. That's that's amazing. Well, I, just in order to be able to share music with as many kids as possible and families. Absolutely. It, and we monetize the, the materials. And so it'd be like if you went to a, a teacher and said, or the teacher said, I'm going to give you free lessons. You just got to pay for the music books. I wanted to make the barriers as low as possible. So if you're, we've heard from families on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean or uh, kids in India. In We have an adult student in Africa, all around the world who maybe don't have access to a local teacher. Maybe they couldn't afford it. And we wanted music education to be available to everyone amazing yeah what what a what a great uh, community service as much as anything that you're able to offer by sharing all this for free i think that's um really to be commended at um this month uh at top music we're exploring playing by ear and we've already talked a, a bit about this you know ear first listening first singing first before the reading happens um so we know this is a key part of your approach is a key part of my approach why has this been a skill that has been ignored for so long in traditional lessons given that as you said earlier so many of the composers we all love and admire and play were probably ear players but definitely were improvisers and they were creators obviously because that's what the music we're playing 
what's happened in the last 200 years? Uh, it's, it's remarkable, right? I mean, so many of the past, all of the, uh, you know, the composers we revere from the early classical period were phenomenal improvisers, creators. And now we kind of think, oh, if you're not a jazz pianist, you're probably not an improviser. And yeah, what, what went wrong? I attribute it a lot to kind of there was this school that came out of like the charity thinking where you've got all these exercises that you've got to learn. And, you know, charity is great for finger exercises, but to learn them, it's a very sight reading based approach. And I think also music publishing probably has steered it in a direction of like, let's put music in books because books sell and teaching music by ear doesn't really sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then on top of that, I think it's easier to teach from a book in a lot of ways. When I didn't know what I was doing, it was really easy to put a Faber book on my piano and just turn the pages. And it did a decent job. I, I have a lot of respect for the Faber method. I think there's a lot of good pedagogy in it. And I don't really have to know how to teach piano if I just turn a page and now, oh, it's time to introduce dotted quarter notes now. Or, you know, and the book, I call it the page turner piano teacher, where you're you're just kind of supervising the turning of pages. You sit at the bench and you let the book do the teaser. That's easy to do. And it's the same way I was taught. It's the same way most of us were taught. It's easy to teach out of a book and it's easy to teach the same way that we were taught. But I don't think it's scientifically grounded, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I really hope there's not too many page turner piano teachers. I can't, I'm going to use that phrase, I think. Yeah, I really hope there's not so many out there anymore, given the wealth of resources that are now available and the research that points to that not being the best way to go. I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, uh, it... I mean, I've been a page turn to piano teacher, and if I'm having a bad day, <laughs> that's what I fall it back on. You know, we all we all need our our aids. Forte is the perfect solution for music teachers looking to build or grow their online music studio. With their revolutionary platform, music teachers can connect with a high volume of students from all over the world. Forte has already connected over 60,000 lessons and more than 3 million minutes of music instruction to date with teachers from over 90 countries. Forte's extensive network of students provides music teachers with an unparalleled opportunity to expand their reach to more students. And once you're connected to more students, Forte's platform allows you to teach on an industry-leading video conferencing system purpose-built for music lessons. It offers Forte Pure Audio for crystal clear sound quality and other features that allow you to do your best teaching online, plus intuitive tools for building and scheduling. Now, music teachers can find students, teach, and manage their business efficiently all in one place. Visit ForteLessons.com to learn more about their platform and how it can help you grow and run a successful online music studio. Well, when I first started talking about teaching with no books, so I've got my no book beginner um, program, uh, I, I very quickly realized that it's all very well for uh, someone like me to say, well, just you know, put the book away and just do some cool improv stuff. When for teachers who, as you've said, have been brought up with the book method, uh, they don't know what to do. If there's no book in front, what do you do? And I understood that. And that's when I came up with the whole framework around how to teach with no books um, by giving various prompts and, and using chords and harmony and, and improv. Um, how do you go about introducing playing by ear? Because I want to give teachers listening some, some real ideas that they can potentially use in their own studios. I love getting kids playing by ear using the singing voice. When a kid sings so much is happening in their brain musically. They're having to deal with pitch. They're having to deal with rhythm. They're having to deal with the form. They think of, of phrases. They think of breathing. And it all happens pretty naturally just through the fact that they're singing. So for our earliest songs in the Hoffman Method, we always sing them first. And that's another great reason to use real folk music because they're very tuneful. They're singable. They have 
interesting lyrics and they're memorable too. So we sing it first and then we break it apart. So our very first song that I teach on day one is Hot Cross Buns. And I also love about folk music is a, a thing I love about folk music is they come with a story often. They come from a country. You can talk about the country. Hot Cross Buns was a song they would sing uh, in traditionally in England. If you were selling something, you'd have a little song you would sing about it to get people's attention as you walked by. And uh, maybe kids would have even sung this to help the family earn money. And Hot Cross Buns are these kinds of roles that you might sell on Easter. And all these bits of context help bring the music alive to kids. Kids love stories, as we all know. So when you can tell a story, you sing the song, and then we might sing it in solfege, or I might teach them the hand signs. Uh, so we can hear it multiple times in different contexts. And then I might just show them how to move their fingers to me, Ray Do for hot cross buns. And then we can go to the piano. And a lot of times, by the time we go to the piano, they're able to play it on their first try almost without any help from me because we've prepared them. We've put the music inside. And that's, I think, part of why I was saying earlier how a lot of kids run home straight to their piano and can't wait to play it because you've kind of soaked the sponge in the musical water. And now that sponge is just like dripping out. It, they can't help but like have that music come out of them. Soaked the sponge in the musical water. This is a new, <laughs> have you used that before? Or has that just come out? I, I've tried, I mean, when I do my teacher trainings, I, I use the metaphor that a lot of methods, it feels like you're trying to squeeze a dry sponge. We're like, hey, kid, make some music, make some music. But you haven't soaked them in any music yet. You're just expecting them to kind of pull it out of a dry sponge. So <laughs> I like it. It's a really great metaphor. analogy. And I, I wholeheartedly agree that the more immersion you can get in the music before they come to play it, um, the better the outcome will be. What about for teachers who weren't brought up singing themselves which will be many because sadly that hasn't been part of uh, many uh, music teachers experiences so they haven't got their kids singing from the start it's really hard to add later on when they're 10 11 12 if they've been learning for three or four years and have never sung a note have you ever managed to have success there Definitely. Oh, so I, I totally get that challenge. And I've learned not to ask kids the question, oh, would you like to sing with me? <laughs> then you're giving them the option of saying no. And so if, if I'm not going to take no, then I'm just like, OK, we're going to sing now. And if they're really uncomfortable with it, maybe they're comfortable humming it. Uh, musicians, and this is what I'll tell my students, musicians sing. Like even if you're a violinist, and, or let's say you're a conductor and you need the oboist to play their passage a little more something, the conductor is going to sing it for them. Can you do it more? Da, 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 da. Or, you know, when we're when we're trying to communicate music person to person and you don't have your instrument handy, you sing it. So I try to communicate to my students, musicians sing. It doesn't matter what instrument. If you're a teacher and you don't feel comfortable with your voice, it, we're not, we don't want to model like an operatic style or a super classical style because then kids will try to imitate a big vibrato or, you know we want a simple sound when i sing for my students i use a very simple sound i don't use vibrato i don't even you know think about it i try to keep the sound just really simple doesn't need to be beautiful it just needs to be you know the the notes so don't worry about how your voice sounds and i would just say get kids singing or humming or whatever you can get them to do. And I, like I said, I don't make it a choice. Mm. Yeah, and, and doing it along with the student. I think the, the worst mistakes I've made before is to go, oh, can you, can you sing this back to me? Or and, you know, I play something and they sing it and I haven't sung it and I haven't sung it with them. I think there's kind of multiple steps you can take here. Sing along with them, firstly, get them to hum, play it, use a kazoo. Kazoos are brilliant. Uh, oh, that's a great idea. Can, I love that because now 
they're humming it and they don't even think about the fact that they're vocalizing exactly so yeah, that's yeah. brilliant yeah i haven't tried kazoo but i'm gonna try that kazoo is great and i have to credit lynette barney who was on the podcast just a, a few weeks ago uh, and actually i got it out of my drawer in fact, i've got it right here because <laughs> i knew she was coming on the show and last time she was on the show she talked to me about it and i got it out and i'm like that's not working wasn't it and i'd forgotten that yeah you do have to you have, you have to, to sing into it hum into it you're humming yeah yep. to to make it make a sound and that's been a great one for me for um for teenagers particularly boys who are, voices are changing and they're feeling a bit awkward that can be a great way around the whole singing thing or at least to open it up uh, that is brilliant i love that i'm taking that home. <laughs> <laughs> go for it um so what about students who i understand using hot cross buns and folk tunes uh, as pedagogically sound ways to introduce things. What about the students when they come in and say, I really want to play this. I've heard it. I listen to it on Spotify or whatever it is, and there's no music for it. Do you work with students to, to try and play by ear in that sense as well? Absolutely. If, you know, motivation, we all know, is such a key to successful learning. If you've got a motivated student, a student it, you, you can't hold them back from making progress. And so, you always have to make a judgment call. Is this piece too hard for the student? If so, is there a way we can simplify it? Can we just do a short section? If there's a song a kid really wants to learn, I'm going to try and work with them. And I love if we don't have the music. I remember the first time I did something by ear was in high school. Some kid in my high school came to me, knew I played the piano, and wanted to do this Mariah Carey song. And they didn't have the sheet music. They're like, can you just figure it out? I was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, and I must have listened to it 500, 1,000 times. <laughs> Figuring it out laboriously one note as, at a time, it was so hard for me. But it was a really great experience. My first song to really learn by ear. And if a kid is dedicated, what a great experience that can be. If there's a song, you know, take it, maybe just learn. 10 seconds of it, learn the main lick, the main theme. And then if they want to keep going, a lot of times if a kid wants to do something, but I don't feel like it's super valuable pedagogically, I may assign it as a bonus thing. Hey, work on this on your own. I don't think you need my help with this. Just keep doing it on going the side with it and see, see what happens. Hmm. Yeah. And, and it comes back to singing as well, because so many uh, times pop songs, uh, when they're brought into lessons, are incre fiendishly difficult to play but quite easy to sing. Uh, and that, again, is why students, the more we can encourage them to sing, the better, because if they can sing the pop song they want to play and just play the chords or the harmony, it suddenly becomes manageable. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what strategies do you use to, to bring uh, the playing by ear into lessons on a regular basis? I know you obviously you introduce it as a way to teach music from the beginning but for students that are more accomplished they've passed their hot cross buttons and things like that how does it become a, a regular part, or does it continue to be a regular part of lessons or as reading takes over do you do less of it i would say in the early months it's a hundred percent by ear and then gradually as we start learning to sight read it kind of becomes a hybrid approach for a time where we're both using the ear we're, I'm playing it for them, we're singing it, and we're using the score. And eventually, we get to the point where it's more of a pure, traditional sight reading approach. In order to keep their ear active, there's a lot of different approaches that I love to use. For one, as they continue to learn more and more challenging repertoire, they should keep listening. I know a lot of teachers don't play new pieces for their students. Well, if it's a sight reading assignment, I would agree with that. But if it's a new repertoire piece, I want them to listen to 10 different performances, go on YouTube, find, you know, 10 different interpretations and really get that music inside of you. I like to think of repertoire and sight reading as two separate tracks rather than one track, because again, true sight reading, no, I don't want to play for them. But I think those also should be slightly easier pieces that they can learn in a few days. I might give them a whole book that's two levels below them and say, play a different song every day out of this book. I just want them sight reading lots of material that's easy enough that I don't have to guide them through it. And I don't even have to sweat if they learned every note perfectly. Just like when 
a second grader is learning to read, they're told to go home and just spend some time reading every day. And the teacher's not checking every word. We just want them to gain fluency. And repertoire, on the other hand, I think is a great opportunity to continue strengthening the ear. Let them listen to great performances on YouTube, demonstrate yourself. So I think just listening to repertoire, giving them assignments to go. If you discover something great on one of your playlists or on YouTube, sending them home to listen to that. And then another great thing is doing some lead sheet work, like getting a pop song, maybe downloading a lead sheet. And now you're combining reading chords with some ear work. And like you can see the chords, but now they're going to have to listen to the original recording to kind of figure out what they're doing with those chords. Mm. So it opens up a lot of opportunities for creativity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The the missing piece often for me is that students don't listen to a lot of the music that we get them to play. So they'll keep listening to their rap or whatever it is and then want to play jazz at the piano or classical. And they don't listen to any of it. Uh, And it becomes very hard. Uh, and you can, you know, give a student even five different interpretations of any piece by Bach, and it will be at any number of different tempi. Uh, it'll be played with all sorts of rubato or not, or staccato or not, or all this kind of stuff. So it's so important um, that we provide them, but we have to now, and I think more so now than ever, if we want our students to listen, it has to be something that we actually give them and request that they do because it's not going to happen organically and parents aren't listening to music. No one's listening to music out loud in their house. Well, very rare now compared to what it might have been a while ago. Everyone's got their headphones on, haven't they? <laughs> Agree. Yeah, no, that's very common now. Everyone's in their own musical world. Well, look, uh, thank you so much, um, Joseph. I, I know we could we could talk much longer about this. Uh, I know people who are listening may well be interested in finding out more about your approach. So is your method available for other teachers to use or is this just something that you use with your students? No, it's absolutely available. I would love more teachers to try it out. If you go to my website, hoffmanacademy.com, you can browse all of our lessons for free, our uh, video lessons. I have over 300 that go through the method. And then there are method books also for sale from the website. If you navigate to the store from my website and then go to the Hoffman method books area of the store, uh, you can find 16 units that start with hot cross buns and brings you all the way up to playing Bach. Fantastic. I hope people will go and check that out. If this has resonated with you and, and sounds like an approach that makes sense to you, uh, as I hope it has, um, certainly has for me, just just with, with the research that you've clearly done. I mean, you're, you know, clearly have a background. You've you've done the work and looked at what's out there. You've looked at Orff and Kadai and Suzuki and gone, what are the best parts of all of these? Well, let's bring it together in something that's modern and approachable and that students really love and that will hopefully make them want to do their chores so they can go and play. <laughs> <laughs> then go and check out those resources. Uh, I commend them to you. So thank you very much for coming on the show, Joseph. It's really been great to connect with you. Thanks, Tim. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Joseph. It was great hanging out with him. Um, I, I met him once at a conference some years ago. And we really only passed, you know, met in passing. And so it was great to get a little bit deeper into Joseph's background and why he teaches what he, what he teaches and how it all works. Uh, he's doing fantastic things and it's, it's wonderful to meet someone with such alignment and similarities in what we're trying to do for musicians and music teachers. So I hope you did enjoy that as much as I did. If you are interested in any of Joseph's products, then head to our show notes page for today's episode. That's at topmusic.co slash episode 330, uh, where you can use our link and get 10% off anything over on his site. Well, that's it for the show today. Have a great weekend ahead and I look forward to chatting with you in one week's time. Bye-bye, everyone. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research into music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. 
With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts, and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, visit us at topmusic.co slash podcast or check out the show notes. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, a production of Top Music. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your week ahead and I'll catch you next time.